In this video, we will cover the basic concept of a vector space. This is a concept that will be applied in quantum mechanics. So what exactly is a vector space? When we talk about vectors, the first thing that comes to mind are the Euclidean vectors that we encounter in classical mechanics, so something like this. However, in linear algebra, the concept of a vector is actually much broader than this. So to put it simply, a vector space is simply a collection, a collection of things. And for these things, we give it a very fancy name. We call them vectors. So vectors can actually come in many different forms. They don't have to be Euclidean vectors. They could actually be something like a complex number. Or it could be even a function. So these are just two examples I can think of at the moment. There are a whole bunch of other examples. So this goes to show that vectors don't have to be Euclidean vectors. They could be complex numbers. They could be functions. They could be anything else. So to illustrate what a vector space might look like, let's say we have a collection or a set of things, a set of mathematical objects. So these objects could be things such as complex numbers or functions. And uh, this set here, let's call it V. So this set is V and it's populated with a whole bunch of mathematical objects. They could be complex numbers, they could be functions. So this set here could be something like the set of all uh, possible complex numbers or the set of all functions where f of 0 is equal to 0. So these are just examples that I could think of. And a vector space is actually a set of mathematical objects just like what we have here. So a vector space would actually resemble something like this. So the thing is, uh, I've given an uh, intuitive description of a vector space as a collection of things, but the thing is, not all collection of mathematical objects, not all collection of things, is actually qualified to be a vector space. So in order to be qualified as a vector space, your set of mathematical objects must satisfy certain properties. Only then, when those properties are satisfied, will the set be called a vector space, and the objects inside will be called vectors. So for the rest of this video, I'm going to talk about the conditions that will enable such a set to be qualified as a vector space. And I will use the set of all complex numbers as an example to illustrate uh, the ideas I'm going to talk about. So the set of all complex numbers is indeed a vector space and each individual complex number is a vector from this vector space. So I think this would be a good example for illustrating some of the more abstract ideas behind vector spaces. So now let's talk about the conditions required for a set to be classified as a vector space. So let's open a new page. So the first condition, so let's say we have a set and we don't know whether this is a vector space yet. So the first condition that needs to be met is that addition and multiplication needs to be defined. And it needs to be defined in such a way such that uh, these two operations are closed. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to explain what exactly I mean by closure in a minute. So in the meantime, let's talk about addition first. So what exactly do I mean when I talk about addition? So when I say addition, I'm referring to vector addition. So the process by which you add two vectors together. So if you have a collection of these mathematical objects, you need to define rules by which you can add up. Uh, add up uh, elements within this set together. So in the case of uh, complex numbers, obviously we do have definition for uh, vector addition. So let's say I have a vector called alpha. So I'm just going to stick with Griffith's uh, notation for vectors. He uses this notation for vectors. So for the case of complex numbers, we obviously can do uh, vector addition. So if I have two vectors, alpha, let's call it a plus bi. I have a vector called beta, which is equal to c plus di. I can add them up to give me a plus c plus b plus di. And you can see that this whole process is actually closed. And by that, I mean, if I have, let's say, a set, I'm just going to call this set v again. And let's say this is the set of all possible complex numbers. And we know that this is already a vector space. And let's say I have, I'm bringing out two elements within this vector space. I'm bringing out an element uh, alpha, and I'm bringing out another element beta. And when I add, add these two vectors together, I get another complex number. Let's call this gamma. And you can see that this is actually just another complex number. So of course gamma is also going to be an element within the vector, uh, the vector space V, because this is just a collection of all complex numbers. So any complex number is going to be included within this set. So that means if I add up two complex numbers, I get another complex number that is also within this set. So this means the closure uh, property is achieved. If I add up two vectors, I get another vector that is also within this set. So this is what I mean when I say that uh, the addition process must be closed. So this is the first 
requirement. You need to define addition in such a way that closure is achieved. So the second requirement is that multiplication also needs to be defined. And by multiplication, I am referring to a scalar multiplication, so the process of multiplying scalars to vectors. So it tells you what happens when uh, to a vector after you multiply it with a scalar. So uh, we can demonstrate this for complex numbers again. So if you multiply a scalar, let's say it's c, to a complex number alpha, you just get something like this. So you get ac plus bci. So, uh, and you can see that in the case of complex numbers, uh, the closure property is also achieved. So you can see that I have a vector alpha, which is from the set of all complex numbers. And then if I multiply a scalar c to this vector, I get another complex number, which is, of course, also within the set of all possible complex numbers. So you can see that for uh, com the set of all complex numbers, the closure property is also achieved for scalar multiplication, and which is something we would expect. We already know that this set is definitely a vector field, a, a vector space. So that's why uh, these two properties are definitely achieved. So you need to, so a vector space must possess rules on how to add up its vectors and how to multiply scalars to vectors, and then these operations must be closed. So I can give you an example of a set. Uh, that is not closed, and uh, that is the set of all complex numbers. So set of all complex numbers in a form uh, that comes in the form of a plus i. So this is the set of all complex uh, complex numbers where the imaginary component is just equal to i. So I can show you that this set is actually uh, does act actually does not achieve closure. So let's say this set is, I'm just going to call it V again. So within this set, I have a whole bunch of complex numbers. And all these complex numbers come in the form of some real number plus imaginary component i. And then if I add up two elements within this set, you see that this is going to be equal to some real number plus i plus another real number plus i, which is equal to a plus b plus 2i. And you can see that this definitely does not fall into the vector space, uh, if does not fall into the set V because this set contains all complex numbers where the imaginary component is equal to i. And then this has an imaginary component equal to 2i. So if you take two components, if you take two elements within this set and then you add them up together, you get another complex number that does not fall, that does not fall within this set. So that's why you can see that the closure property is not achieved. So that's why for this set of complex numbers, this is actually not a vector space because the closure property is not achieved. So this is what I mean when I say closure. So uh, to recap, you need to define addition, uh, vector addition, you need to define scalar multiplication, and these processes must be closed. So apart from this requirement, a vector space must also satisfy uh, a set of eight axioms. So addition and multiplication must be defined in such a way such that a set of eight axioms must be satisfied. So I'm just going to list these axioms out. So the first one is that uh, vectors must be commutative. And that means if I have two vectors, like say a and alpha and beta, if I add them up, this is going to be equal to beta plus alpha. And you can definitely verify that this is definitely true for complex numbers. So let's say I have a plus bi plus c plus di. This is equal to a plus c plus b plus di. This is by definition what happens when when we add up two vectors within the vector space of all complex numbers. And then by basic arithmetic, I know I can switch the order within these brackets. And then by definition of vector addition, I know that this expression is actually equal to c plus di plus a plus bi. And as we know, this is equal to beta plus alpha. So let's just say this is alpha, this is beta. So you can check that for complex numbers, this first property is definitely achieved. Uh, the vectors are indeed commutative. So uh, this might seem a bit trivial, but it's actually very important for us to check whether these axioms are satisfied. Otherwise, we will not be able to use all the, all the conclusions that linear algebra gives us, because it's all uh, dependent on whether these axioms are satisfied. So even though this looks pretty trivial, you do need to you do need to check that uh, to check whether these axioms are satisfied. So the second axiom is that vector addition is associative, which means that if I have three vectors and I add them up in such a way, this is going to be equal to 
adding up the first two vectors first and then adding the third vector. So it doesn't matter which order we do vector addition in. We can add these up and then add this, or then we or we can add these up first and then add this. So once again, you can check this for uh, complex numbers. I'm not going to go through that again, but uh, yeah, this is the the associative property. So the third axiom is that your set of mathematical objects there must exist a so-called null vector such that if you add this null vector to a, another vector it will not change the original vector at all and then uh, for complex numbers the null vector is obviously equal to 0 plus 0 i and then this vector definitely uh, is contained within the set of all complex numbers so you can see that for the set of all complex numbers there does exist a vector such that if you add this up to any other vector uh, then it will not change the original vector, which is obviously true for this. So you can see that for the set of all complex numbers, this third axiom is satisfied. So the fourth axiom is that for any given vector alpha, there's going to be an associated vector called the inverse, whereby if you add them up, this is going to give you the null vector. So we call the definition of null vector is a vector such that if you add this up to another vector, it doesn't change anything. And then in the case of complex numbers, the set of all possible complex numbers uh, this definitely, the inverse definitely does exist. So for any given complex number, a plus bi, the complex number negative a minus bi also does exist because this is just another complex number. So this, of course, is going to be inside the set of all complex numbers. And you can see that if we add this up, you're just going to get 0 plus 0i, which is going to be the null vector. So you can see that for the set of all complex numbers, this fourth axiom is also satisfied. So, so far we've gone through four axioms and where well, we have eight axioms so for the next four axioms they have they are related to uh, scalar multiplication so the fifth axiom is concerned with uh, the distributive property so this expression is equal to this expression so you can distribute the scalars amongst the vectors and once again you can check that this is indeed true for complex numbers i'm not going to go through that again and then the sixth axiom is also related to the distributive property. And this time you're going to distribute vectors uh, along uh, through the scalars. So this left-hand side expression is going to be equal to this right-hand side expression. Once again, you can check that this is going to be true for the set of all complex numbers. And then the seventh axiom is related to the associative property. So recall that this is actually kind of similar to this second axiom over here. So the, here, it doesn't matter with what order we do the addition in. And then for scalar multiplication, it doesn't matter uh, what order we do the multiplication in. So we can either multiply the scalar to the vector first and then multiply a, or we can just multiply the scalars together first and then multiply it to the vector. And then the final, uh, the eighth axiom, is that uh, scalar addition must, uh, sca scalar multiplication must be defined in such a way that when we multiply one to any vector, this must give us uh, the vector back, so it doesn't change the vector. So uh, in the book, Griffiths actually uh, puts an additional uh, requirement for the eighth axiom. He also says that zero times alpha should give us the null vector. But then this is act this is actually not very necessary. Using the eight axioms that we have over here, we can actually prove this uh, additional statement that Griffiths includes in the eighth axiom. So uh, maybe in a later video, I can show you how we can uh, derive this property using the eight axioms that we already have here. So here are the eight axioms, and so to recap, uh, if you have a set of mathematical objects and then you want to de determine whether it is a vector space or not, you must first define uh, how you want the objects within this set to behave when you, when you add them up, so when you add them up, and when you multiply scalars to them. So once you have defined this and then you check that for your set of mathematical objects, the closure uh, property is achieved, you can then check whether addition and multiplication is defined in such a way such that all these eight axioms are satisfied. And if these eight axioms are indeed satisfied, then your set of mathematical objects will indeed be a vector space.